My name is Eirik. I come from New Compass Press, uh, a small English language publisher located here in Norway. Uh, and I have been invited to speak about uh, the Rojava revolution. Uh, I've been asked to speak about the war against Daesh, the ISIS, uh, about the situation in Syria, uh, particularly to focus on the democratic institution of uh, self, the self-management institutions of Rojava, and also to speak about the role of feminism in this revolution. This is the Syrian civil war. Rojava is located to the northeastern uh, sections. Those, these are the, uh, you don't, may not see this very well, well but this is, the, this is the areas controlled by Assad's forces. Uh, and the, these are controlled by the uh, Free Syrian Army. Uh, and the yellow ones are controlled by the Kurdish forces. And as you can see, it's a very, uh, very, very uh, confusing situation. This is, I think, the latest map from January or February. Uh, and for every month, this picture uh, is changing. And I think that this actually shows more uh, continuous lines than what has been the, the case for most of 2014. The situation is uh, extreme when we speak about the war. There are, as I said, total Syrian refugees outside of Syria is uh, close to 4 million people. And the internally displaced uh, refugees, they are uh, uh, more than 7.5 million. Uh, this uh, shows a little about how the situation is. The situation for the refugees uh, it's very difficult. This is from uh, Dohuk. Uh, a very, uh, when we pass through the uh, Iraqi regions, the Kurdish uh, regions, uh, regional government in Iraq. Uh, and this, as, as you see, the, that's uh, open buildings uh, where was the wind blew right through it. This is from the Nevros refugee camp, and uh, where we met a lot of children. We spoke to the older. Uh, people from the Yazidi community. And uh, this was in late November, early December. And uh, what we immediately heard was uh, we need uh, not only food or medicine, but, but it's very cold. Uh, this was just thin tents. Um, and in these communities, which were outside of, uh, that was in Iraq, uh, they don't, it didn't even have tents. Um, I told you I was uh, in uh, Iraq and Syria. Um, I took part of an academic delegation uh, of, consisted of uh, 10, 11 people. Um, I am for obvious reasons, not in that picture, because um, I took it. Uh, and what I'm going to show today is roughly uh, a short, brief excerpt of about uh, uh, or selection. I, I took more than 2,000 pictures, so it's I'm trying to uh, rush um, through to give you a decent impression of uh, the situation. Uh, what we w uh, were there for was to discuss with the variety of community organization, uh, movements uh, of the political parties, uh, of the defense forces. And we traveled over the only, um, the only uh, border crossing uh, that was at times open, which is Semelka, located on the higher corner of uh, uh, Rojava uh, to the northeast. This is Rojava. Uh, it's uh, a lot of things have changed after Kobani, uh, which brought uh, attention to the Kurdish question in a manner that was not easy to get across earlier. This is roughly the Rojava, it means the, uh, the land where the sun sets, uh, Rojava, uh, where, where, so that's to the west of Kurdistan. It consists, uh, this is the area of northeastern uh, Syria, which uh, is uh, designated as Rojava. And these are the uh, three cantons, the Afrin, uh, Kobani, and uh, Jezre. We came across the border crossing here, went to Derik, uh, many cities uh, across that region. 
When we speak about Kurdistan, I'm just going to, I hope that I will say some things that are uh, provocative, and I hope that I will also say a lot of things that are well known to you, because uh, it's important to know the situation. So some of it is basic information, and some is, I hope, more challenging. This is roughly the area known as Kurdistan. It goes through four countries, uh, Turkey, Syria, uh, Iraq, and Iran. When it comes to how the Kurds are uh, um, settled, you see that this is the predominantly Kurdish areas. There are large uh, diasporas within Turkey uh, and uh, within other parts of Syria. Uh, within, uh, within the area uh, that is, um, there are roughly 20 million people living in, uh, uh, in Turkey, uh, some 10 million in Iraq, and uh, lesser populations in uh, Syria and uh, Iran. Um, as I said, this is that part that Rojava claim as their self, uh, area of self-government. Uh, when we discuss both the Kurdish freedom movement and the situation in rough Java, there are ex there there is a lot of, uh, there are lots of acronyms: uh, the BDP, the KG, KRG, the PYD, the uh, PUK, PJAK, uh, and often those acronyms it's the same. Uh, they change when you write them in uh, these this letter, few letters words. It changed if you speak it in Turkish or Kurdish or sometimes even between Kurmanji and Zorani, but, but usually it's, uh, uh, and the, they're, they're very fond of these. But these are some of the main actors. The PYD is the Party for Democratic Union. Uh, it's, uh, these are the, the main actors in uh, Rojava. Um, it's as closely associated to the PKK, uh, which is perhaps the most uh, well-known acronym, uh, of course. Um, PYD, uh, PYD is the party uh, that has uh, been really at the forefront of this uh, revolution. KNC is uh, the Kurdish National Council, and that is the High Council of uh, the Kurds, uh, Democratic High Council. Something like that. It's uh, it's the uh, the co some of the coordinating structures. You have, of course, the YPJ and the YPJ, which are the defense forces, Ekitia Palestina Gel, or and the women's movement, which is uh, YPJ. You have the Tevdem, which is the democratic movement, uh, a movement for a democratic society, and you have a, a lot of other movements. Uh, for instance, we were at the Yekitia Star Academy, there are uh, a lot of uh, women's organizations also here. Um, I'm trying to rush this a little, so sorry if things take uh, a little time, but, um, but uh, last time I was invited by Mutmak to speak about the Spanish Revolution. I was thinking I would speak for an hour and I spoke for two and a half, so I'll, I'm trying to rush this, uh, even though the situation is much more confusing than uh, was Spain. We came over here, traveled to um, Derik, uh, here close to Jazeera, the, uh, the Turkish city, uh, Rimelan, uh, uh, Tirbespi. We went to Kamishlo, uh, Dirbesi, and Serekanye, and here, uh, and through Am uh, Amuda, and uh, uh, traveled to visit a lot of organizations uh, and uh, institutions. Yes, uh, these. Um, to, to kind of sum up the uh, situation regarding the war, these are the Kurdish uh, defense forces. It's particularly the YPJ uh, and the women's uh, organization. Uh, the YPJ was started in 2004 on the initiative of the PYD after the Kamishlo massacre, uh, where uh, there was initially some brawl between uh, some provocations and uh, brawls at the football stage, and it was uh, met with heavy repression, where all, uh, more than 30 Kurds uh, were killed. 
and um, the PY Day, which had been established in 2003, decided that they would not make that happen again. So they built up their military organizations. And at the time when the Syrian civil war broke out in the uh, early, well, uh, through several stages, March, uh, but also from January, connected to the Arab Spring in 2011, uh, the, the Kurdish movement had already de developed uh, uh, a defense system. The YPG was started. The YPG uh, accepted women fighters uh, alongside men, much as the, uh, the PKK forces had been doing in uh, the Kandil and the, the mountains, um, and, um, oh, and uh, also the PP PKK in um, the mountains of, uh, of uh, Turkey. But uh, still, they established a separate uh, women's force, uh, which um, are defense units, which consist entirely of women. And the third force to be reckoned with on the Kurdish side of things is the Azaish, which is security forces. I will speak a little more about that uh, later. Um, but what did I, what did I learn in, uh, of the Rojava revolution? I was told to speak about the war against Daesh, I learned that it's definitely not only a war against uh, Daesh, the ISIS, uh, it's, um, it's definitely a social revolution. We met with a lot of people on all levels of society, young women, old men, uh, and what came across was this self-confidence and that's this feeling that they were about to turn society upside down, so to speak or as uh, we would say, uh, to, to allow society to, to, um, to come to the front and, and, uh, and, and express itself. Uh, I was also told to learn about the direct, uh, talk about the, the, the institutions of democracy. I'm convinced after being there that uh, this is a new uh, political movement with institutions that are distinctly communalist the municipalities are at the basis of their political organization. Their system is structured around communes, cities, and municipalities, and uh, um, that's, that's the defining, if there is any ideological uh, category to put on it, uh, it's, um, it would be the defining one. And the third word was that uh, it's, Maybe more than even that it's uh, that on the role of feminism uh, is the acknowledgement that the women's movement is at the center of this revolution. They have a series of movements in institutions and they can uh, both veto decisions that are uh, uh, that concerns women's uh, issues and they are really pushing the men forward and um, it is an interplay, but uh, there, that, women, that it's a women's revolution, it's, it's kind of difficult to categorize it with the traditional uh, feminist uh, terms here in the West, but that women are guiding this uh, without doubt. But it's also, if we're talking about the Rojava revolution, it's impossible to, get a, uh, to avoid the centrality uh, of the ideologue, uh, Abdullah Öcalan. Uh, he was born 48, 49, and uh, he was the founder of the PKK, the Kurdish uh, mm, Workers' Party. In 1978, they founded that party. Uh, in 1984, they decided to go in, enter into an open confrontation with the Turkish state. It was a conflict that uh, lasted for roughly 15 years. Many would say it's, it's still going on, but, uh, but uh, it claimed, has claimed around 40,000 lives uh, in uh, either uh, open conflict or with uh, repressions against the movement. In 1999, he was abducted from uh, Kenya and he was, um, taken uh, to Turkey where he served on the isolation uh, on the Imrali Island, laying 
in the Marmara Sea just outside of Istanbul. If we look at, at his ideas, uh, and how they uh, influence the, uh, the revolution in Rojava, we can look at the, uh, his concept of democratic confederalism, um, which is taken to be a, 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 the founding political principle that they adhere to in and to, to dis designate their political system. He has also been trying to develop what he calls a sociology of freedom, a social theory that, that takes as its premise uh, that he wants to cha challenge the um, regimes of truth and uh, to, to advance a new, quite li libertarian social theory. He is also the originator of the concept genealogy, which is that social science uh, which takes uh, women's liberation as its founding principle. It's kind of like the, uh, translated, it, it, it would be something like the, the political science of women or the social science of women. Uh, and also, he's uh, the originator of the concept of democratic nation, which has turned uh, much of that national struggle uh, on its head. I, I hope to return to that. We are going to, to uh, publish uh, uh, Erchalan's works. This is the first of a six volume work uh, uh, on the, uh, it's kind of uh, Erchalan's concluding thoughts on, um, well, the, the critic of existing society and the struggle for, for, uh, for a democratic civilization. Uh, we will publish this. Volume three is uh, The Sociology of Freedom, and uh, it's, a, it's a call for a democratic civilization. Much of uh, these concepts were also developed uh, in Europe uh, in an interplay. This is from the book. I, I recognize some of you from, uh, from a conference in Hamburg just last weekend. And uh, this was the book that came out um, uh, a co uh, three years ago at the con after a conference three years ago, where it's an attempt to challenge capitalist modernity. It's an attempt to build uh, a new struggle for social liberation. It has been said recently that uh, Bookchin has been much uh, analyzed, uh, no, much uh, inspired. Uh, by the um, people often use the term anarchist, uh, Murray Bookchin. Uh, I worked closely with Murray Bookchin from 1996 to 2006. Uh, he did uh, develop the concept of social ecology, which uh, have clear pal parallels to the Kurdish uh, freedom movement and to Erchalan's terms. And, uh, and so I will briefly explain this. I hope to, to return to this later. But uh, uh, um, but it's I'm not going to claim that the, the Kurdish revolution is uh, or the Rojava revolution is a social ecology um, revolution at, or a bookchinist. Um, it is very much inspired by it, and it has many parallels. But both Erchalan, uh is a very creative thinker, eclectic, tries to drive, uh, build on a lot of very, uh, a huge variety of sources. And he, um, he uh, and the movement that uh, exists in Rojava uh, is also, it's not just a one man ideology, it's a movement that continually discusses. And uh, it's been remarkable just to, wish, uh, to see from afar the developments that has taken place from 2002, 3 to uh, uh, 2000 at the conference uh, three years ago, and now the conference now a few days ago. Uh, but social ecology, basically a theory that criticizes all hierarchies. Uh, it, uh, in the 1970s, uh, 60s and 70s, it tried to challenge all hierarchies, not just exploitation, classes exploitation, not just uh, uh, 
uh, patriarchy, not just uh, other forms you know, uh, of domination, but to systematize a theory on non-hierarchy. Social ecology has always um, emphasized the need for public popular assemblies. And it, it has tried to systematize that into a municipalist approach. Confederalism, the need to confederate over larger areas, uh, to create a unity of diversity, unity and diversity of communities, and for cultural autonomy. It broke uh, very much with the na national liberation struggle, the, the, the classic Marxist-Leninist uh, theory, or the, um, the attempt to create a proletarian dictatorship. Uh, but what are the structures of the Rojava revolution? In 2012, they proclaimed the cantons. This is not, uh, it would roughly, uh, this is taken obviously from, from the Swiss fr French word, uh, and it approximates our filke, uh, the county level. As I said, the communes are the ba uh, basis, that, that, that's urban neighborhoods, that's villages, uh, and they also have structured, um, created a system that is structured on city councils, but also uh, uh, on, the, on the interplay with the canton level, the commune level, and the uh, city-wide level. And throughout here, on many different levels, there are popular movements that push this, um, push this revolution forward. For instance, Tevdem, or several of the women's organizations, they are... Uh, there are some fascinating parallel structures. I'd love to go in detail, but uh, then you know, um, um, it, this will take a, a lot more time. These are some images from uh, some of the assemblies we um, visited. Uh, the, they have, uh, always have a quota of women in the leadership roles. They have uh, at least 40% and they, of every they have co-chairship, and uh, one of them has to be a woman. Um, this is uh, how people uh, decided on things. This is from the, uh, one of the neighborhoods in Kamishlo. Uh, so I'm talking a little about the communalist or municipalist structures. Uh, but I'm, as I said, Shoresha uh, Rojava, the, the, uh, the, the, the Rojavan revolution. It is uh, uh, a woman's revolution. It's, this is from one of the roundabouts. And uh, it, uh, it was obvious from, it's, it's very difficult to translate it because it's not really feminism on the Western side, uh, in, in a Western sense, but uh, with a sense of uh, curiosity, with a sense of, uh, integrity and with a sense of creativity uh, that I think we have much to learn from. Of course, women's role in the armed forces. This is a, a young woman from uh, Dirbespi guarding the Tigris River. Uh, these are from, uh, as I said, there are popular assemblies, but there are also women's assemblies uh, parallel to this. And these are from uh, one of the <clears throat> young women's associations that we uh, visited. Um, I will speak something about the challenges um, because there are immense challenges for uh, Rojava. But it's interesting that they're uh, trying to uh, recreate or regenerate civilization actually in the very cradle of civilization between the Euphrates and the uh, Tigris River. This is from an old Roman bridge, um, and our driver, um, ah, anyway, um, uh, there was a sense of enthusiasm about that project that I um, would like to convey that uh, I, I'm not sure I'm able to do. I will speak some about the uh, challenges. Um, uh, that's, this is from uh, the Asaish, the training academy. Uh, the security forces, they insist that we're not a police force. We're, uh, we're, we're 
here for as long as is necessary, and uh, we uh, only want to, to uh, you know, help community defend itself. And it's fascinating because many of the, they were having like a three-week course, four-week course, uh, up to two months, defending, uh, depending on this, the, how the front lines were shifting. So some of them suddenly would have to rush to, to control areas. But mainly the Asaish was um, doing roadblocks and the security and community patrolling and so on, while the YPJ and YPG uh, were at the front. Um, but many of the Asaish uh, were also at the front. This is from meeting with the local YPJ unit. Uh, um, um, well, several of the women had been uh, um, wounded with the, in fights with the Daesh the week before. Um, so much I would like to tell you about all this situation, but uh, this, uh, I will rush to it. This uh, uh, signifies much of the s symbolism, that uh, how they um, emphasize respect for their martyrs. And there, there are many fascinating aspects of it. It's, it's uh, not at all, um, it's, yeah, it's a genuine social revolution. I, I could point to a lot of uh, aspects here, but uh, the defense forces um, really face the challenge. It's about 60,000 troops maybe under uh, YPJ, YPJ control. Uh, and around uh, 10,000 uh, 10, YPJ, that, that was established in 2012. And the, uh, the Asaish may be count between uh, five to 10,000. But this is changing, uh, of course. They were recruiting and so on. These are some of the other challenges. Of course, medicine, this is from the refugee camp. They, there are uh, a lot of displaced persons within Syria, also in Rojava. Uh, this is from the Nevros refugee camp. These are, of course, wounded from the war. Uh, and here you see, uh, uh, this is actually Dilad, one of the organizers. She's excellent. And, uh, but you see that the medicine, uh, they have very little, limited access to medicine. That's a big challenge. Uh, and this is the entrance to one of the heavy Azur uh, clinics where, um, you know, no smoking and no machine guns. Uh, it puts it in perspective. The economy of Rojava uh, is highly um, based on it's based on two things essentially. One is oil; have access to a lot of oil there. But under the Assad regime, they were only able to extract a certain amount. Uh, they they couldn't uh, build. Uh, they couldn't build uh, pumps or, or plants that, that uh, they, they were always small, and small pipes went, went to tr transport all the uh, oil to be, uh, to be uh, refined within, to the west, within the Assad you know, uh, controlled regions of Syria. That's you know, maybe an obvious thing for, for a regime to control. Uh, there was also many restrictions on what kind of activity you could do there. But oil is an important resource. Um, but that they didn't have a refinery doesn't seem so strange. Uh, I mean, the state would control that and so on. But what was uh, even stranger that is that this was a very uh, monocultural uh, wheat production region, wheat, some barley. And they didn't even have a mill in the whole of Jazeera Canton, which is counts for maybe two and a half million people, uh, a little more, uh, and they they were always shipping the uh, the uh, the grain to be milled, and so so when the war started, they they really had to build mills from from uh, from the ground to in order to provide bread for its population. These are some some of the cooperatives. Uh, this is a sewing cooperative. And this is also economically one of the uh, benefits from the Duhok agreement that was uh, between the Rojava and the KRJ in Iraq, uh, which transports some goods there. Apart from that, it's, uh, of course, um, 
based on a lot of smuggling because all of the passes towards uh, Iraq is controlled by uh, and Iraq and Syria is controlled by uh, Daesh and towards uh, Turkey is controlled by, by the Turkish state. Um, and challenges regarding education. This is from Mesopotamia Academy in Kamishlo. Uh, they were trying to build a new uh, university for social sciences there. Uh, this is uh, uh, Slava, one of the uh, bright young students uh, that I encountered uh, during our visit uh, in the garden. Uh, she, uh, in a sense, symbolized a lot of this uh, struggle because uh, in Serekanya, she was from Serekanya and had to uh, move from, um, move from uh, uh, Serekanya when Al Nusra Front, another organization that came across from Turkey, uh, and uh, overran the city, but now it was taken back, and it's, it's fascinating because it's not all about the war, it's, it's a lot about the giving people like Slava um, hopes and the possibility of having an education in, uh, in, uh, in the Kurdish region. And this is, uh, actually it's, it's one of the pictures that made me the most sad, uh, because I knew about, you know, the, the difficulty in providing medicine and so on. But this is from the main library of the Mesopotamian um, Academy for Social Sciences. And that's, they almost had no books. Uh, a lot of it was, uh, uh, yeah, uh, for leftover from earlier. That's, it's a huge difficulty, uh, a huge difficulty in, in providing literature and things they can study, particularly in Kurmanji. Uh, and this is from, um, from um, well, actually, this, this was some of the younger students. Uh, ah, there's much to say about the school system, which are both interesting, but also uh, signify a, a highly challenging uh, situation. This is from Salim Moslim. He's one of the uh, he's the chair of the um, of the PYD, uh, one of the really important figures. Uh, when I was in Hamburg, I moderated a session with Ashia Abdullah. Um, I'd love to have a lot of quotes from her too. Uh, it's it's a leadership that is very self-confident, uh, very modest, but still um, highly ambitious. And I just uh, uh, think that the whole revolutionary project for them seems to be an educational project. And the whole, everything they do to rebuild their communities is also, uh, and, to, and to, to get a new education and so on, it's, it's really uh, challenging turning much of the discussions um, upside, uh, or changing the situation, the whole situation. Uh, I went to Rojava. Um, as I said, I worked with, uh, with Mary Bookchin uh, for many years. Um, uh, and uh, we were, I remember the first times then when uh, Erchalan's lawyers contact, approached him and said, uh, you know, I've told every city uh, councillor in Turkey of the, from the Kurdish movement to read urbanization without cities. And I'm told everyone to read the ecology of freedom. And we were like, it was this uh, bizarre uh, situation. Uh, and uh, because of the, the violent history and the, the, the Marxist-Leninist background of the PKK, um, it was kind of, uh, a little difficult to, to, to grasp at once. But it's, it's, um, uh, it's, uh, I, I, I went to Rojava uh, and I feared to be uh, disappointed because we had been working with the Kurdish freedom movement. We've been working with his uh, lawyers and, and uh, his translators uh, for years and we, follow the discussions, follow the movement, uh, and I was afraid of being disappointed. Um, I was afraid that either I would, A, see a Maoist revolution, uh, which uh, 
in which uh, the party leadership, uh, in which Öcalan, which you know is on every wall, had a much tighter influence um, on the movement, much, uh, much more control, that you get the feeling that there is, it hasn't really shed itself of the Marxist-Leninist past. But I got, uh, from everyone I met, uh, from the various units um, and attachments to women's movement, um, and we spoke to many of them, I never once saw um, one of them uh, kind of looking to their, uh, the one who was next to them or to their seniors or something like that. Uh, to, to look for, you know, this recognition. Did I say the right thing? Or, you know, uh, that you get the feeling that it's, it's not really a social revolution. No, this was definitely, uh, definitely a social revolution and the people there are conscious of it. Um, and the second thing I feared was that it, I would see an anarchist revolution. That it was really uh, uh, made more out of necessity, more out of the crisis situation and you would have all their talk about assemblies would signify just getting together, uh, discussing some things, or that there was really a chaotic situation of, uh, of movement where there was no power responsibilities anywhere and so on. But coming down uh, and seeing the, uh, the discipline, the, the self-discipline, the confidence and their, their belief in new political institutions. Um, I can say that it's, uh, it's neither a, a Marxist-Leninist uh, revolution or an anarchist revolution. And I think that uh, I believe that both Marxist-Leninist or anarchist or syndicalist or whatever should support it. It's, it's a genuine struggle for women's liberation, for new political structures, for cultural and political autonomy within a, a broader democratic Syria. But uh, uh, we kind of miss the picture if we reduce Öcalan or this movement uh, with, with uh, just um, like the new stage of uh, national liberation struggle. Or if we say that now this was really inspired by the anarchist Murray Bookchin. Well, Bookchin was no anarchist. He was an anarchist as he, in the 70s and earlier uh, in, during the 80s. Uh, and he was a Marx, uh, Marxist uh, in the 30s and 40s. And I think that to now, after people like Mary Bookchin, try to influence the anarchists, try to convince them that municipalism is the politics, the anarchist politics for the 21st century. Now that syndicalism has failed, that anarchist organizations like the cooperatives have failed. Uh, and it's kind of ironic to see, but none of them wanted it. And they said, no, Bookchin, he's just, he just believes in the city-states. No, he, he just wants the, the municipalities, the elections. And that's not really anarchist. Uh, and now that it, it comes back and says, oh, but anarchists were really for, in favor of municipalism all along. And, uh, and that's, it's, a, it's a bit bizarre uh, to... to and I think that I would not say that this is just the ideas of Bookchin, but we have to recognize, we have to recognize the role of Erchalan, we have to recognize the new political structures, and we have to recognize the movements that are there on the ground creating these alternatives uh, today. And, uh, and to do that, we have to also uh, to also discuss what is novel about these ideas, because it's not just a dress rehearsal, just changing the rhetoric to, uh, to really create the old politics uh, that uh, we advanced all, all along. Oops. Um, and I think that those, I, I think I managed it within 45 or 50 minutes. Uh, uh, that's uh, not bad, but I think that the significance of Rojava in a time where uh, most traditional ideologies 
have exhausted themselves uh, in a time when the left, uh, much of the left, have been preoccupied uh, more with uh, targeting USA or Israel as a, as a, a big enemy instead of create, discussing how we can create alternative communities, how we can create an alternative politics in the here and now. And in, in, a, in a situation where we, as a movement, are so entangled in debates that happened 30 years ago, 70 years ago, and uh, that we reproduce a lot of the conflicts and the dis distinctions. Uh, uh, there is a need for a creativity. There is a, cre a need for creating new political structures and new movements that are able to grasp this and create an alternative. And I, as I told people there, I genuinely believe that Kobani has the significance for uh, Rojava as uh, Petrograd had for the Russian Revolution. I believe that Rojava have the significance for the libertarian left, that Barcelona and the Catalon Catalan Aragonese uh, systems of government had during the Spanish Civil War. And I believe that the Kurdish freedom movement can point to an alternative way uh, for the Middle East. But if we're doing that, uh, if we really want to explore that issues, we have to take them seriously and to see uh, what are their unique features and what are their uh, novelties and, and what are their significance for us here. <laughs>